This is Hannah Byramovich, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. Hannah is uh, an author of a book. We're going to have her come on and talk. And I guess basically what we described is it's a history of the Second Amendment. It's called the Second Amendment and the fight over guns or whose right is it? The Second Amendment and the right over guns. Uh, and I'm, I'm interested to have you on. Also, I wanted to have Ryan Petty on because he works also in, uh, you know, how do we reduce violence uh, through guns, through other things? And I thought it might be interesting. Ryan has his own episode of the Break It Down show. Uh, and unfortunately, I guess the big reason why Ryan is relevant in this conversation is he lost a daughter during the Parkland shootings. And so I figured since we have um, two people working on kind of the same problem through different means, it would be a really healthy uh, conversation where we don't have to all agree on the approach, and but we all agree on where we're going, you know, like what we're, what we're trying to get to. So thank you for joining us, Hannah. And Ryan, thank you. Ryan, when I presented this to you, what were your thoughts? Um, well, uh, you know, until I had a chance to to read through Hannah's book, um, I, I my assumption was like, the assumption I've had to make every almost every day since February 14th when I lost my daughter Elena, which is that this is uh, this is probably another attack on the Second Amendment. This is going to divert um, the res divert resources, conversation, uh, things that we could be doing to prevent school violence into this black hole pit of Second Amendment debate that uh, we never seem to to come around to any consensus on. And, and in, in my view, it, it sets us back. So that was my thought going in. <laughs> Pete, I think H you're Hannah, muted. when you looked up Ryan, what were your thoughts? Um, you know, I was interested in hearing his perspective uh, coming, you know, to the issue as somebody on the other side of the aisle. I'm really curious to see how that informs his ideas about what steps we can take, bipartisan steps we can take moving forward. Ryan? Um, look, I'm, I'm interested in having a discussion and we did some things here in Florida. In fact, we put the first sort of gun legislation on the floor of the Florida legislature and I think it had been over 25 years. So I've, I've argued for some gun restrictions. Now we did some things in Florida, which we thought at the time would be helpful, like restricting the age uh, when you could purchase a rifle in the state of Florida. We had a lot of unknowns, uh, specifically around the age group of 18 to 21. Um, they tend to be, that age group tends to be the school attackers or the public space attackers. It doesn't mean all of them are, but it, they tend to be in that age group. Um, we, we thought it prudent at least for a time, to, to restrict um, those firearms like handguns were restricted to the age of 21. Um, and, and I think my thought at the time was that it would be a temporary uh, uh, change. We also enacted red, a red flag law here in Florida with the support of um, many in the law enforcement community. Um, it's, not, it's not something that has been particularly popular with the 2A community, I think there's some arguments to be made about how it should be implemented and some good discussions there. I do think uh, it has been a tool that has been useful for law enforcement to do something in the cases where the public constantly says, hey, why didn't you stop this tragedy? Why didn't you stop the, this other tragedy? Law enforcement a lot of times had their hands tied. Now in the case of Parkland, I don't think their hands were tied. Uh, they could have acted, they, they chose not to or they didn't. But I think red flags is an area where there could be some discussion and conversation, understanding that that puts me at odds with the majority of the 2A community. I wanted to start with kind of throwing this out there so we can see like we're, we're talking really truly about this, this common problem, but with maybe different means or different goals in terms of politic politically. But in terms of policy, it's often like there's room for negotiation back and forth. So I don't want to go too far down this road right now, but I do want to get back into your book, Hana, because you, you um, this is your first book, by the way, <laughs> way, to, way to take a big swing at a nice, easy topic. <laughs> what, what pushed you to take this on? I mean, this is the big thing. And then how the heck did you get McMillan to even consider it? Um, you know, I think what pushed me to take it on was because I wanted to add the literature to the topic for the for a younger audience 
Um, you know, as we know, young people are affected by this problem every day, um, whether it's, you know, their backpacks, school shooter drills, um, uh, metal detectors when they go into school. It's a problem they face, but the existing literature was targeted towards an adult audience. Um, and so, you know, the existing literature was also, uh, you know, there were books on history, there were books on policy, and I was hoping to create sort of an all-in-one uh, digestible sort of textbook on the Second Amendment. Um, and working with my agent is how we got it to Macmillan. I think they were interested too, I think especially after Parkland, um, in providing this literature to a younger audience. And then Ryan, as you went through the book, what stood out to you as being uh, helpful in terms of you know what, what Hannah was trying to say and talking to this younger audience? You talked to young people quite a bit too. What did you think? Well, first of all, let me congratulate Hannah on, uh, look, I've never written a book. I don't know what goes into it. It's a lot of work and uh, I can only imagine. So, you know, kudos to you for uh, the effort. Um, I also like the approach. I do think we should have these conversations early on uh, with, with young kids. And I think, I think there was a time when we did. I think, you know, when I was growing up, firearms were a part of my life growing up. It was not un unusual for my dad and I to have a conversation about that. They were typically around safety. <laughs> it wasn't sort of the history of the Second Amendment, but it was a lot around uh, how, to, how to be around firearms and do that safely. Those are the conversations I had uh, with my kids growing up also. But I, but I have to say, you know, I appreciate Hannah's effort. Uh, um, and sorry, it may, it's Hannah. I apologize for that, Hannah. I appreciate the effort there, and I do think it's a conversation worth having. Of course, I have problems with the content and and your portrayal of the Second Amendment, per particularly around uh, the founders' views of the Second Amendment, but I do think it's a conversation worth having. Let's talk a little bit about what you found, Hannah, along the way, because you know you have to look at history through your lens, and then maybe you you grind some other you know aspect in to deal with your own personal bias. But maybe you don't. Maybe your job is just to report it. When you got into the work, what did you find? And then how did you deal with with bias? Because we you know we all have it. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think honestly. It, it was more about sort of piecing apart motives through history. And I know, right, we might view uh, the way the founders were thinking about the amendment differently. Um, there's a, you know, DCV Heller encapsulates that debate. Mm -hmm. uh, I think um, in research for me, it was important to, to uh, think about the motives of every sort of historical character or historical player. Um, and think through perspectives that maybe I hadn't um, hadn't thought about before. For example, I had no idea the integral role the Black Panthers played in the evolution of the Second Amendment and in its history. Um, and I think sort of understanding that uh, and um, you know how that maybe influenced or was the precursor to a shift within the NRA, all of that um, sort of sketching the history, I think was really important to me. The NRA and Black Panthers is relatively recent history, at least us old folks in the show. What about stuff that was, you know, uh, post-colonial, antebellum? What about that era of the Second Amendment? Did you learn anything interesting during that time? Yeah, I was super surprised by the amount of regulations there were in those eras. Um, you know, regulations on where you could store gunpowder in a house, uh, concealed carry regulations, and there have been many scholars um, uh, before me who have sort of cataloged and um, written up those, those extensive historical laws. Do, how well, one of the things about the Second Amendment, and I think it applies to all the amendments, but, you know, things have changed. You know, I can have a very powerful handgun and that wasn't possible in the early 1800s, you know. So how much of that legacy stuff is even relevant anymore, do you think? And how much of it is uh, surprisingly still relevant. Like, I mean, who stores gunpowder in their home anymore, right? Right, right. Um, you know, there are these older laws about dangerous weapons, which are 
guns rigged with a string so you didn't have to mm. pull the trigger on the handgun. So there are echoes in the past, right, uh, for, for what we see as dangerous today. But obviously the machinery, the the deadliness, that, that all is very different and maybe is a reason to think about the amendment differently. Ryan, feel free to ask any questions you want to. I want you in here because of your perspective. Sure. I look, you know, one of the things that, um, I, that I enjoyed about Hannah's book was, was, uh, you know, I learning some of those laws and, and ordinances that were in place. I think when you look back though, to the, you know, my, my contention and my argument is that it's very, the, the founders were very, very clear about what, what they meant. And I think the, the, the basis of Hannah's argument in her book is that, the right is not necessarily an individual right. It was the right of the militia. And I think that couldn't be further from the truth. When you go back and read what the founders were writing at the time and the history that, that preceded them in English common law and what they understood of English common law and the, and the necessity of protecting uh, the individual right to bear arms, I think that premise falls flat. And so, it was hard for me after reading that that the argument or one of the base arguments in the book is that this is not an individual right, it's the right of a militia and it should be well regulated and therefore uh, legislatures and executive uh, executives in the states and in the federal government have the rights to or, or the abilities to limit this fundamental right, I think is contrary to everything the founders believe. And they were they were quite clear on this. Um, I mean, Benjamin Franklin, they that can give up essential liberty to to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Thomas Jefferson, I prefer dangerous freedom over peaceful slavery. And certainly uh, George Washington, which I think we all point to uh, and think of fondly as our first president uh, today on uh, Inauguration Day for a new administration, a free people ought not only to be armed, but disciplined. So um, it was quite clear, and I, I've got a hundred quotes here from the Federalist Papers and other contemporaneous uh, literature of the time, but it, it's quite clear that this was intended to be an individual right. And that was reaffirmed in Heller, um, contrary to sort of the preceding 80 years of, of theory that it was not, in fact, an individual right, but was just a, a right given to a state militia. Hannah, you're a lawyer. What do you think? So, you know, I would actually sort of answer a slightly different question, which is even if we totally disagree on that, even if it is um, an individual right, I think maybe we can both agree that it's not an absolute right. Um, and that that's what that paragraph in Scalia's opinion, District of Columbia versus Heller was getting at, that there are places where the right can be limited. You know, the same way the free speech right is not absolute, can't yell fire in a crowded theater, can't bring a loaded weapon to schools. Um, and I don't know, I'm curious to hear what you respond to that, Ryan. Well, I, I think there have been limitations on it. And I do, th and I do think um, there's a place for discussion. But what is typically proposed, and it it's really apropos that we're having this conversation today based on the fact that we've got a new administration coming in that, that looks to be probably the most anti-gun administration in the history of the country, um, and, and will probably try to implement a series of executive orders that will restrict or limit freedoms. Um, I, I, think, um, I think we, it's, it's as, as important as ever to understand the original intent of the founders and what they saw as the best way to prevent uh, tyranny and the lack of, or the loss of the other freedoms articulated in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. I want to jump in and I'm a ground truth guy, as you guys may know, for sure the audience does. So when we look at trying to legislate these things, 
I have to be careful how you even say this because YouTube will block any kind of content that talks about the assembly of weapons. Like, so mm -hmm. you can literally make a gun in your home now with a drill press and a few simple tools. You can put everything together. Have we reached the point where gun laws are almost obsolete anyhow? And then do we want to allow, because the planner, because the combat guy, the planner has the ultimate advantage. They can decide whatever kind of death and destruction they want to do and how they want to meter it. I mean, no one pulled a gun during the um, Oklahoma City bombings. So is this stuff, whether it's absolute or not, is that almost irrelevant? Are we losing Are we losing track of what we're trying to get to? And then let me add another thing, too. With the last year that we just went through, it was super rough. We learned a couple of things, for sure. As we all drove less, the earth took a pause and breathed and seemed to do better environmentally. And we also learned that the police aren't necessarily reliably going to show up, especially if you're in a community where there isn't much police. You can be in Kern County, California, and not have another cop around for half an hour. The other day, we had police officers on the show, and what this lady said, she was an officer in Oakland, California, and she was the only free officer in the entire city because everybody else was either sick, broken, or actively engaged in some kind of policing process in Oakland. So when we look at these things, we think, gosh, you need to be able to protect yourself. How do we deal with these? And I guess I'm asking you, Hannah, first, but how do we deal with these realities? How do we deal with the, the, the planner's advantage, um, being able to defend our home when we can't rely on the police necessarily? I mean, even in Oakland, you cannot rely on the police. It's crazy. And then and then just the ability to just simply make these things on a 3D printer at home or at the drill press. So uh, again, not a challenge, but just this is a reality. Yeah, the, I mean, the 3D printing, there's a case on it right now. I, I can't remember exactly sort of what stage of litigation it's in, but I know that there's a case challenging the ability, you know, for people to make those 3D guns. And because it's sort of novel and confusing, it wasn't a Second Amendment case, if I'm remembering right. It was something under the Arms Export mm. Control Act. Um, Interesting. Maybe. Um, but you're right. It's It's... You know, it's different, it's challenging, and it makes it seem like uh, it, it will be much harder, you know, when people want to obtain a weapon to stop them because there are so many avenues that they can um, that they can go through. Um, and I think, you know, there's it, it just it, it there's not going to be a way, I think, to prevent everyone, but I think that there are ways to reduce harm. Uh, um, and reduce the opportunity for folks who might not be as sort of committed to getting the weapon to getting from, from getting it. Reducing harm, Ryan, that's right up your lane. What are your thoughts? Well, again, uh, I think to, you know, to that point and to Hannah's pr previous comment, I do think there are places where we can come together and look at where, um, new laws or regulations could be helpful in the prevention of criminals using guns or those with intent to harm others from using guns. I, st I stated red flag laws earlier as an area where I think there's opportunity to have a, have a discussion and conversation. Is that an infringement on the second amendment? Um, yeah, I think it probably definitionally is but it may be a place where reasonable folks can come together and, and, and figure that out. But the majority of gun control legislation put forward is really meant to disarm either law-abiding citizens or citizens with which um, the powers that be did not like or disagree or want to be part of society. When you look at the arguments and debate around the 14th Amendment specifically at that time, that clearly the arguments there were uh, in in response to the very uh, racist and targeted restrictions on freedoms of you know freed slaves post civil war and and one of the favorite tactics of those in the south that were trying to to prevent uh, these newly freed slaves from becoming full citizens and participating in the you know with full uh, force in the United States was to restrict their gun rights. So there were literally groups going around confiscating firearms from freed from freed slaves, uh, restricting their gun rights, taking away their um, their ability to store, uh, you know, powder and ammunition and those kinds of things. So 
when you look at the history of gun control measures, most of them take aim at law-abiding citizens and those that are vulnerable and need to protect themselves. Pete, your example of Oakland. I mean, I just saw a video the other day where there was a mentally ill man in uh, downtown Portland and the police were trying to talk to them and they'd been there for an hour. And because there were demonstrators that came up alongside on both sides and started creating almost a riot, they had to draw law enforcement from across the city to come here and do crowd control so they could save a man's life. Look, if you're, if you're looking at uh, law enforcement as, as your, your self-defense force, your protection force, we're all gonna be sadly mistaken. I learned that the hard way, certainly on February 14th. But when you look at all of these school shootings and most of the public space shootings, the responding law enforcement doesn't get to them. The Secret Service study of the last 41 incidents of school violence, only one responding law enforcement agency was there on campus during, during an attack. And that was because they were there doing a drug sweep. Oh, you simply can't get there in time. And so the, the, the ability for a person to defend themselves and have the means to them defend themselves is exactly what the founders intended. And regardless of the technology, it needs to be preserved today. I want to come back to you, Ryan, on this because you're, you're making a lot of really powerful points that I, I think are, are fair and part of this greater conversation. The the school shooting thing, you know, there's a pattern. We had Phil Chalmers on the other day talking about school shooters. This guy studies mass murderers and, and serial killers. And so he knows the patterns. I, I believe you do too from your own work in this. We can identify these folks, and if we were able to identify, and we and we have the technology specifically to track it, but we don't we don't like a a, a intelligent strong state. But if we were to target these folks that have mental problems and present, a, you know, as someone who needs maybe to have their Second Amendment rights at least temporarily restricted, does that also apply to something as important as the right to vote? If you were too crazy to own a gun. Should you be allowed to own a vote? And it's a hard question, but this is the con this is the conversation we're trying to have. Well, I, I, I uh, that may be a little bit outside my wheelhouse, but I think if you're convicted of a of a felony, I think you certainly lose the right to uh, to to bear arms for a time until your rights are restored. I think there should be a uh, uh, you know what I will say is I think there should be a redemptive process. I don't think that should be punitive and it shouldn't be forever. So I think there should be a path to restoration of rights. But I do think if you've threatened, uh, if you've committed a felony, you've used a firearm or you've uh, committed another act and you're a threat to uh, fellow members of society, I think society has a right to, uh, to uh, restrict your freedoms, as it were. Can this be a predictive thing though? Like you said, you know, we take the Phil's test of people and, and your your nexus of like 18 to 21 years old. Can we preemptively restrict these people's access to the, you know, a, a weapon and deny them their second amendment right reliably? Well, I think we can, I, actually, I think we can. And my example is that uh, what, what Phil's probably talking about is called behavioral threat assessment. And it's what the secret service uses to protect the president. And they view it as, as important as all of the weaponry that they have and defensive means that they have at their, at their disposal to protect the president. And so what they do is when somebody makes a threat, they, you get a visit from the Secret Service. And that visit includes, you know, hey, how are things going? And a little bit of your background. And they try to understand you. And then they bring resources in to help. Their goal is not to arrest necessarily. Now, if you're if you're a credit, if you make a credible threat and you have the means to carry it out, then it probably goes into the criminal justice system. But if if you don't have the means to carry it out, they they try to bring other resources. The prop the that same model works in our schools. And it's it's the law in the state of Florida. It's the it's been used very effectively for years in the state of Virginia. It doesn't require a police state. And it what it does is allow resources to be applied to those uh, individuals that are in need, students that may be struggling, kids that may be struggling, adults that may be struggling. The conversation we really should be having, I think, and not the one about restricting the rights of law abiding citizens and their Second Amendment rights in particular, is what should we do as a society about mental health and how do we identify those folks that are struggling and then how do we get them the help they need? That's a conversation we should be having. 
I'm going to give uh, Hannah a chance to respond. I know we covered a lot of ground there, and you know we're trying to be respectful to everybody. Hannah, what are your thoughts on what Ryan has, has said in this whole past segment? And any, you know, and we also covered a lot of ground with like police in Kern. I mean, my buddy Dan is a cop, I and mean, he's had a friend in Kern County, and the guy got into a, um, a, a basically a fist fight for 20 minutes, and reached the point of exhaustion and there is no help coming and backup was still 20 plus minutes away. And so he pulls his gun on the guy and because of our legal system, that becomes a problem. But he's like, you don't understand. Like I had nothing left. It was either I was going to have to shoot this guy or he was going to comply, you know? So we have these hard, hard problems to solve on the ground. What do you think? It's just as challenging. I'm interested in your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, your example reminds me of what Ryan was saying about disarmament um, and the history of disarmament in this country, um, which was also one of the very surprising and interesting things I learned as I was researching the book, you know, that the KKK was founded in large part as a disarmament organization um, to disarm newly free black yeah. people. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. And then you see, you know, during the civil rights movement, you see that a lot of protesters had to either rely on their own weapons or other folks who were sympathetic to the cause to protect them um, and couldn't rely on the police for protection. And it is definitely a thing that runs through here. And I know you asked me earlier, how did I avoid bias in writing? It was sort of taking all these issues and viewing them, trying to view them absent today's lens, right? Mm. Um, because I'm, like thinking about disarmament that way probably isn't the most pro gun control way that you know it's but it but what happened um and it is a way that that folks used to try to control um anybody they deem dangerous which for right. much of american history was indigenous and black people right. um and so it's interesting it's super interesting my first draft of my book was like you know i, I read it and i was like am i interested in gun control <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, it's a really complicated history. And that is actually what I think is so interesting about the book and about the issue right. um, is that there it's it's nuanced. Um, and you know your examples about the red flag laws. And I actually would love to hear more from you, Ryan, on this because I know you're probably closer to to that than I am. I think they're a really interesting idea. I'm just curious about, so in, in my understanding, if somebody is deemed a threat to themselves or to others, a court can take away the gun. So the questions I have for you, if you know about that, are um, so how often is somebody, is that reliably ascertained before anything dangerous happens? Um, you know, I know a lot of times there are warning signs, but maybe sometimes there aren't. Uh, and then I think my second question on that is, um, is there a process for those folks to get their weapons back? What do they have to show to get those weapons back? Those are sort of the questions I, I have around that. And I want to add a question to this, uh, Ryan, to have you kind of deal with this as well. We, we never talk about capacity. Here we have a story, a credible story about an officer being alone in Oakland. So when do you say, oh, my gosh, we've got a, a, an epidemic or whatever you would call it, a mental, a mental health crisis going on, and we have to flex in extra officers from outlying agencies? Is there a mechanism for that in case there's, you know, look at 2020, not how many people are struggling mentally with it in general. I mean, there has to be more people considering gun violence just because of the massive amount of impact there is. All right, I'm going to you talk well, but great questions. And let me address maybe yours first, Pete. I, it, look, the way law enforcement supports each other, they have interagency agreements where where they work cooperatively. If there's an officer or deputy in one jurisdiction that needs backup, the other cities can respond. Um, but that doesn't mean response is coming in a time frame before you might you know, uh, pass out or be incapacitated. So it, it is an issue. It's an officer safety issue. It's a public safety issue in general. And I do think we have to do something different around how we treat and deal with those with mental illness. And that, that was really why, you know, um, Hannah's question about red flags was interesting to me because Look, I, I, I take it very seriously to restrict somebody's freedoms. So to take to remove somebody's firearms, and I thought about it in my own case. What you know, would I want my firearms taken away? And I would think in mo in almost every case, I would say no. 
however, um, the way the way it's supposed to work, and and Hana, it varies from state to state. So I think si since Parkland, I think there are now 17 states with red flag laws. That's a that's a huge tremendous jump from from um, the time of the Parkland tragedy when I think there were five or something like that. So a lot of states have adopted this. Um, there's grant money from uh, the Department of Justice to, to help facilitate this. And I would imagine the Biden administration will push very heavily for more states to adopt red flag laws. But the way it typically works is there needs to be a credible threat. Uh, depending on the state, sometimes that could be a family member, um, which can present problems because um, it could be a vindictive uh, former spouse or, or something like that, that that can raise the red flag. Um, but typically the way it works is law enforcement will come out, have a conversation with the person and understand if the threat is credible and if they have the means to carry out the threat. And if both of those conditions are met and, they, and they're still intent on carrying out the threat, then they will uh, get it. I believe it's called an administrative ruling, but they'll get a quick ruling from a judge that allows them to confiscate the firearms. And again, depending on the state, sometimes that goes to another family member that doesn't live in the household. Sometimes that law enforcement agency takes those. And then the way it's supposed to work is that within two weeks, you have another administrative hearing where a judge hears uh, evidence for and against. And if the judge deems the threat to be uh, not credible, then your 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 full your firearms are restored, your rights are restored. If the judge views it to be credible, then that can be enacted, or that that ban of possession of firearms can go as long as a year. Um, and that's typically the way it works. The problem most Second Amendment folks have with it is this idea of denying somebody a right before uh, a fair hearing or before a hearing, and that's that's the rub here, and that's the one that intellectually I have trouble with too, but I don't know a better way to do it. I don't know a different way to do it other than you take the guns away that day and then you sort it out in the morning. And I don't know how else to do it, but it does strike me as 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 being a, an area where potentially it could be abused like we saw at the time, uh, you know, post-Civil War. Hannah, uh, is that a fair answer to your question? That's helpful. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. I want to ask you the kind of the opposite end of the capacity question, you know, like how do you flex in more resources? One of the things we struggle with and, and you know, I'm sort of in the middle on gun control. I'm sort of in the middle on everything. <laughs> I'm, I'm okay with it, except for California it makes me have a background check with the proper ID to buy bullets. Not okay with that. That seems to be like you're harming um, legitimate citizens' ability to buy to buy rounds in some way. So, and and, and again, if we're going to go bigger picture, if I have to have a, a ID to buy bullets, then how come I don't have to have an ID to vote? Right? Like we have these these incongruences in our legal system. So, let me ask you this. In a nation of 330 some odd million people uh, with estimated over 400 million weapons, and every time we bring up the conversation of weapons control, we sell more weapons than ever before. How do we, how, how much gun violence is okay? I mean, how do we go like, hey, we've backed up, we need to back off these laws because, you know, this really isn't a problem anymore. Is it one death? Is it no deaths? Is it, you know, and I don't want you to put a number on it, but how do we know when we've over legislated this? You know, I mean, the goal is always harm reduction. Um, I think it's interesting to compare statistics from the U.S. to other countries uh, with stricter gun laws, um, you know, because you see in, in countries that are of similar incomes, uh, there are similar levels of crime, but those crimes are less deadly um, in, you know, in large part because they are, you know, if, if you get in a fight with a knife or your fists, you are less likely to be able to kill someone than if you have a gun. Um, and so I think using other countries as comparators um, can help us. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, the multivariate problem, you know, comes in, of course, and you're like, well, I mean, one of the things I always suggest is we'll we'll struggle always with socialism because we're not a we're a diverse country. You know, we have a lot of different people, a lot of different geographies, a lot of different religions that we all try to deal with here. Um, 
<laughs> Ryan said a dirty word earlier to a lot of millions, millions and millions of people. He said red flag. And he was like, you know, this is a red flag law. And there are people who are pro second amendment people that lose their minds over those two words. Uh, in your bio that I pulled off of, of your website, you had the, um, what words did you had? You had, um, uh, institutional racism in there. And I had someone in the promo lose their, not lose their mind, but react very negatively to this, these simple words, red flag, racism, you know, and these things drive us crazy. How do we ever get to a position where we, I mean, we have a system to, to amend the, the constitution, right? We, we, we all know that there's, there's a path for that, but we're, I often say we're not any better than any generation before us because they struggled to pass these things too. To ratify a new constitution now, can you imagine? Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's almost comical. How do we deal with this problem in a way that makes sense when words split us so deeply? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I hope for bipartisanship on this issue and on many issues I think, I mean, I'm glad we're having this conversation. I like, I see that we have common ground. Uh, you know, we don't agree on a lot of things, but we do have, you know, we both see the words harm reduction and are interested in that. Um, and I think to the extent lawmakers can also unify around, um, you know, concepts or goals like that, uh, that would be good. <laughs> Ryan, what about you? How do we have this conversation when you, as a guy who like are you know pro Second Amendment, when you say the word red flag, people lose their minds. I mean, I'm sure people right now are pissed off because you said those words. Yep. Yeah, I'll take some heat for it later on because I'll you know I'm supposedly defending the Second Amendment, and then I'm and then I'm giving away red flags, and I and I express my concerns around around due process, right, with red flag laws. So I, I do think there's more work we need to do there. Look, uh, it, my, my view on this, I, look, I appreciate that we're having this conversation. I appreciate that Hannah took the effort to put a book together. I may disagree, yeah, with, I may disagree with some of the premise, but it drives a conversation. And what's not happening in our country right now are conversations. I don't have to agree. Um, we don't have to agree on everything, but we should talk. There is a process for amending the Constitution. I know it seems impossible in today's <laughs> environment for that to, to happen, but that was on purpose. The founders intended it to be a difficult process. Um, but I do think that if, if there is something that we want to do here around changing the Second Amendment, there's a clear process for that. As for harm mitigation, I'd love to find a way to live in a safer society. I just don't believe that restricting the rights of law-abiding citizens is how we get there. We have to deal with the criminal element, the illegal use of firearms, and and those are uh, those are problems that are a lot more difficult to solve than just simply passing gun legislation. And we learned that in Parkland. That's why you know I sat on the commission investigating the tragedy, um, and our recommendations had very little to do with gun control, a lot to do with mental health, a lot to do with securing the perimeters of the school. We, we did something that probably upsets folk, a lot of folks, which is we called for more armed security on the campus for the reasons we've talked about earlier, because you can't get there fast enough. We believe, and I believe that it takes a good guy with a gun to stop a bad guy with a gun. And unfortunately that's the world we live in. But, but I, think, I think if we could have conversations about how do we deal with dangerous people that have access to firearms and how can we separate that, that intent to harm somebody and the means to carry that out, I think that's a conversation worth having. I don't know that red flag, law, red flag laws are one approach. I don't know if that's ultimately the best approach, but that's a conversation I think we should have as a society. Same question I asked Hannah earlier. How do you know when we've done it? Like how much violence is acceptable in terms of you know reduction of harm? We did that just now. We someone someone put their gun down. Success, right? But uh, we also don't want to overstep. You also don't want to deny rights in other areas. Like I said earlier, we have the technology to listen to every phone call. I mean, we can do that, too, but we don't want to live in that kind of a state that's denying another kind of right. So how do we know when we need to do more? I mean, it's, it, on the second pro Second Amendment side, it's really easy to do less because that leaves it up to the people, but. I think as a nation, we're not satisfied with that. How do we 
how do we twist that knob effectively, especially when we do this at the White House? You know, <laughs> we just go crazy left yeah. and right with that thing. Yeah, every four years. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm with Thomas Jefferson here. I prefer a dangerous freedom over a peaceful slavery. So I would uh, I would argue that, um, you know, we do the we do the best we can. I think we we spend time with our kids, educating them on on the history of our country, the unique position we hold in history. We, we teach them to value and cherish their freedoms. Um, I would like to see more kids get off their phones and social media and the other things, uh, and I include myself in this, uh, and go outside and play with other kids. I mean, I think the lessons that we need to learn to have a, a society where we can sit down and have a conversation Unfortunately, our, some technology is, is, I think, getting in the way of that. And I, I would like to see us change uh, our approach there. I think we should challenge our kids with new ideas. I think we should push them um, and we should uh, encourage them to think about those ideas and debate them uh, you know, in their own minds and with their friends. Uh, I, I, I would like to see more of that in our, in our society. I think that's the only path to get us out of the sort of uh, quagmire we're in right now. Hannah, any thoughts on, on what Ryan just said? I agree that I think, you know, we do need to have young people talking about the issues. I hope that the book does provide a springboard for that, provides history, provides questions, um, further things for, for kids to look into. Um, and, you know, I think some, a, a reaction I've gotten a lot to the book is I really wrote a book about guns for young people, but I think that it's actually a really important age um, to introduce, you know, because they, they know the problem, right? They deal with the problem. And so I think it's not new, but introducing the history, the policy, the debates around it, I think it's really important. I want to talk a little bit more about your book because we've kind of gone around the issue. And I think it's important to have done this exercise to you know, illustrate that, hey, look at this. We've all gotten along. We've all said things in, and we've managed to disagree very politely. But I, I want to talk to the intellectual part of your brain. I mean, look, everybody can look at your, your, your educational performance, where you've been educated, uh, the places that you've worked and go, wow, like all we can be is impressed. So appealing to your intellectual side, how many times did you get mad at yourself for violating your own beliefs? You're like, God dang it. Now I'm partly more pro second amendment. And, you know, cause I have these fights all the time as I try to sort these things out. And that's sort of what's pushed me to the middle. I, I don't know. I just want to believe in each other. So when did you, what kind of things made you argue with yourself and get mad at yourself for being such a, you know, I don't know, prejudiced person who didn't understand things. And now that you do, you have a new, a new vision on things. I don't think I ever got mad at myself. I think that my goal throughout was just trying to understand like what the truth of the thing was. Right. And so my goal was always to, to read the historical documents, to see how people were thinking about this in the 1700s, 1800s, 1900s. It was always an inquiry and an ex exploration. Um, and I wanted to sort of come to, I, I wanted to uncrystallize my conclusions before research and come to new ones based on research. And right, you know, that led me to a similar point, uh, one that I'm sure <laughs> Ryan disagrees with. But I think uh, what was joyful to me about the process and, I, you know, was never upsetting at all was trying to come to those conclusions based on research myself, you know, that I had myself done and not policies that I had just heard about uh, for most of my life. Did you have a sounding board as you wrote this book? Say, I need someone to, to hold, because I mean, look, Ryan's like, this is absolutely an individual, right? You say it's absolutely a militia, right? Did you have a Ryan along the way as you wrote this book? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I talked to a lot of folks in my life uh, from various backgrounds, you know, lawyers who helped me iron out uh, some of the legal issues, uh, teachers who helped me understand how to, you know, uh, present this to a younger audience, my editor who poked questions or poked holes in all my conclusions and made me analyze each logical step in each assumption um, you know, there were a ton of sounding boards without whom I don't think I would have, I would have been able to finish it. 
What ended up on the cutting room floor that you just didn't didn't advance the story? Oh, it did. It's not that it didn't advance the story, but it is my favorite image that wasn't high resolution enough um, to print. <laughs> Uh, it is from a very, very early uh, uh, newspaper publication. I don't know if it was called the newspaper then. The Army and Navy Journal, uh, which, you know, uh, was where the NRA published its first little advertisement, or the two men who founded the NRA published the advertisement that led to the formation of the organization uh, from, you know, I think 1971. Um, but it was really fuzzy and grainy, but it was so cool. I had been digging through all these digitized archives of Army and Navy journals years past, and I found on the back page of this, of this old, old publication, the actual words and seeing it, you know, seeing it in the font, it's just so cool. It was really exciting. <laughs> That's great. Ryan, what, uh, what things stood out to you in the positive about Hannah's book that you uh, appreciated? I, I mean, apart from just doing the job, what, what did you go, you know what, that, I can deal with that. Well, yeah, there's a lot to just doing the job of writing a book, I can only imagine. But um, look, I appreciated uh, um, Hannah's look back at, at gun control uh, legislation for you know and restrictions and how that had been applied to to groups in the in in and targeting them really for um, target targeting uh, the removal of their rights. I, I appreciated the sort of I thought you handled that honestly um, because I think the temptation there would have been just to say, hey, look, we've done this before there's nothing sacrosanct about restricting gun rights. We've been doing it for a hundred years, but I think um, you, you went, you, you, you were able to um, show that it was really targeted to certain people and certain groups. And I, I appreciated your intellectual honesty there. Um, and again, that's, that's, um, um, I think high, high praise there. Um, so I, I appreciated you doing that. Right. You talked last time we were on the show um, about the accomplishments of President Trump along the way. As much as uh, he is a, a disdainful fellow for many, you know, he had a long list of things he had actually done. And it's shocking when you read it. One of the things you talked about in that discussion was uh, his openness to meet with you and your peers and talk about this school violence problem. Um, can you, since it is you know, inauguration day. Can you talk a little bit about that positive experience that you had with President Trump? Because we tend to skip over that stuff and just go to the salacious. And then what are your plans to engage with the Biden administration? Yeah, so we, so it, was, it was quite interesting. And I saw another side of President Trump that I didn't see in the media. Um, and I don't, I didn't see portrayed in the media. Um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say I was very disappointed in sort of the post-election um, messaging coming from pre from the president. Um, that was uh, disheartening to me um, because I thought that uh, there there could have been um, legitimate issues that that could have been addressed there around voting integrity and some things like that. That I think we've now missed an opportunity there um, the way that was handled. Um, but having said that, um, the president was willing to engage with the families of the Parkland tragedy and others, Santa Fe and Sandy Hook and others, um, regardless of their political views, uh, many of them didn't vote for the president, wouldn't, uh, would, didn't, didn't vote for the president, wouldn't vote for the president, had very different views on gun control than the president had, but he was willing to engage with us in a conversation. The thing that I appreciated most about the president and his cabinet secretaries that worked on um, an effort called schoolsafety.gov that is, um, I hope, will remain. It will see if the Biden administration takes it down or changes it fundamentally. But schoolsafety.gov is a resource for school districts around the country, school administrators, school safety experts that really has valuable information, including grant funding for how to protect, you know, to protect schools. And he championed that effort amongst uh, four different uh, agency departments <laughs> that didn't that 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 didn't want to work together necessarily and couldn't necessarily work together because of the way the funding works but he said just figure it out just make it work and so they did 
and uh, I saw leadership there on that on that effort that I that I appreciate very much and will forever be grateful for. And I think parents across the country should be grateful for it. Um, but it focused the discussion around school safety on the things that I believe really mattered as opposed to just arguing about gun control, which is what we've done after every other school shooting. And what about your peer parents in the um, in the unfortunate club that you're in? Well, there's some, so the majority of the families are represented by a group that I've talked about before called Stand with Parkland. And again, we have varying views on every issue, but particularly around gun control. And um, uh, that group was represented there. Um, we do have some families that did not meet with the president, didn't either, well, just didn't meet with the president. And we're only interested in talking about gun control. So I, I would say the the middle of the group, the majority of the families for sure, were willing to have a more broad conversation about school safety. And that, and that pushed the conversation forward. And really that's the model for going forward. Now, how do we work with the Biden administration? Just to quickly answer that, I, I'm not sure because I'm not sure if the Biden administration is interested in anything other than gun control. And so if it's only about gun control, I don't know that there's a lot we can do, but I hope and pray that they will look at what was done by by the Trump administration and say, hey, there's some good things here. Let's see what we can continue forward with. Now, that, that's awesome. Thanks for saying that, Ryan. I, I really appreciate it. I want to ask you one more question, then I want to give all the rest of the time to, to Hannah. Uh, you, you're, you're a person from the future if we're in 1700 something or 1800 something. If you were able to go back and sit with those founding fathers, and say, let's adjust this because I'm telling you this is going to be a problem later on. What what bit of that Second Amendment would you want to adjust? And what would you want to have them clarify or change or admit or whatever it is? I wouldn't change a thing. It's an easy answer. Uh, in fact, I think we're we're far too restrictive on on the Second Amendment today. Uh, we've allowed loca locales and states to restrict that freedom far far more than the benefit and harm mitigation we might get. So I think we're actually doing, there's actually more harm created by, by the restrictions we've, we've imposed. So I wouldn't change a thing. What I would warn them about is the, the very pernicious evil that I see in our society that, that tries to um, rewrite the history of our founding and the thoughts and discussions that went into the deliberations that ultimately led to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. I would warn them that they, they might need uh, some sort of a, uh, you know, 11th Amendment that, you know, w w back then it would have been an 11th Amendment, I guess, to uh, force uh, better civics education <laughs> uh, for, the, for the kids of the country. But I think, uh, uh, unfortunately, that's an area where if you don't understand the history and you don't, then you do, you can't appreciate it. And if you can't appreciate it, you don't care as much about it. And then it's gone before you realize it. Hannah, I want to give you a chance to either address some of the things that Ryan said earlier in terms of dealing with the Trump versus Biden administration, but also I want to, I want to put you in the time machine too, and have you go back and, and maybe even go with Ryan and what would you guys have to say to these uh, incredible people that set us on our way? Um, you know, I don't know that I'd be left in the building back then. But, <laughs> well, all right, um, yeah, but you're from the future, so you could just zoom right into the building. I'm okay. putting you in the building. You're there. You're sitting next to TJ and George and everybody else. And I'm wearing pants and I have short hair and everybody's, you know, shocked. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. But were I there? Uh, I think I would include, and I, you know, I mean, this was encapsulated in Justice Scalia's opinion, but I think I would ask them to include a clause that said with reasonable restrictions, I mean, they don't have to say with reasonable safety-based restrictions, but I think to that, I think absolutely the idea that there should be a balancing test between sort of the freedom on one hand uh, and safety on the other. I had an interview the other day with someone who told me she saw a protest sign that uh, put those two values sort of, uh, you know, at odds with one another. And I think that that is the balancing test that informs uh, analysis of the amendment. And I mean, Justice Scalia acknowledges that in in his opinion in DCV Heller, but um, to sort of, 
to avoid any doubt, I would ask them to include that clause and then I would travel right back to the future. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Uh, what would you like to see the Biden administration do with it with, in terms of reducing harm? Yeah, I mean, I think it's worth sort of thinking really hard about what's effective. Um, you know, the assault weapons ban uh, that was in effect from 1994 to 2004, um, it, uh, as I'm sure you both know, but, you know, just to sort of, uh, sort of define it quickly, it attempted to ban assault weapons, but it couldn't ban, you know, all semi-automatic guns because most guns in America are semi-automatic. Uh, and so it banned them based on their design characteristics. Um, anything with a military style design characteristic was banned, um, which was ineffective, right? You know, manufacturers could quickly just sort of change the design and get around restrictions and, you know, create guns just as deadly. Uh, and so I think um, it's important to, to uh, you know, to not sort of blindly enact laws that that are ineffectual in that way. Um, I think one thing that sticks out to me and, um, you know, I'm curious about the, the bullet background check that you mentioned earlier, but thinking about the, the private sale uh, loophole, which, or how it's colloquially, it's colloquially, <laughs> colloquially referred to as the private sale uh, or the gun show loophole. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about how that, uh, might be plugged, um, I think is important. You know, I think some 40%, that's an old statistic. I'm not actually sure if it's still 40%, um, but a large amount of gun sales uh, uh, occur through private sales such that they do not require um, a background check. And yeah, I think we also need to think about the effectiveness of background checks uh, and what databases are being used and what, you know, I think all of these sort of they're all attempts at getting at dangerousness, right? You know, the disenfranchisement, uh, I'm, I'm, or the, you know, when people who commit felonies cannot uh, get weapons later, that is an attempt at getting at dangerousness. Mental health laws are an attempt at getting at dangerousness. And these are both paradigms that don't exactly map on to dangerousness, right? Um, and so I think thinking through uh, sort of A, fixing the private sale loophole, B, um, uh, fixing the background check system and trying to think through whether there are other ways, perhaps red flag laws, as we've discussed, that might better target and more accurately target uh, the, the, the idea of dangerousness. I appreciate that. And that, I think that's a good, uh, I mean, a good, platform for the Biden administration to work on. I mean, if they can plug some of these holes, uh, you know, I, I think we can all take it. Uh, again, I'm sort of a middle of the road guy, you know, don't deny my access to bullets. Don't deny a, a legal person from buying a gun, but I have no idea how to solve Chicago's problem, you know, without some constant case management of people out there who are just, you know, they're in a battle. I mean, there's way too many people dying out there, and I'm desperate to figure out how to solve that. So appreciate that. I also appreciate you for writing the book, Whose Right Is It? The Second Amendment and the Fight Over Guns. You can get that on Amazon. You see it streaming across there in the page if you're on the live side. And if you're listening on the podcast side, look in the show notes for that. That book's Adam McMillan. And uh, you know, I appreciate you coming on for that. I want to give you the last word. Is there anything else you want to say? Hopefully you can appreciate the conversation we just had. This is you, but also everybody out there in podcast land. But anything else that you want to just get off your chest or say, hey, uh, I want to say this one last thing. I just wanted to say thank you for having me and thank you, Ryan, for being here and uh, for reading the book and engaging in conversation with me. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Hang on, you guys. I'm going to put a little video up. Stand by. Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here are the next episodes you should listen to, curated by yours truly. Thank you so much for watching the Break It Down Show.